With the upcoming election, today's episode couldn't be more timely. Stay tuned to hear a lively discussion about politics in the workplace with clips from the popular TV show Mad Men. But before we turn to that, I have an important announcement. My co-host and partner, Evan Gibbs, has decided to step down from hiring to firing to concentrate his time on his burgeoning, multidisciplinary corporate espionage practice. It has been an amazing three years working with Evan. We have discussed so many topics, from professional work attire to the right way to terminate employees to leadership. Using such diverse TV shows and movies as Parks and Recreation, Modern Family, The Matrix, Beef, Office Space, and many more. Evan and I are amazed and very proud of the podcast growth, with a total of more than 40,000 listeners in the past three years. As our podcast begins its next chapter, I am excited to announce that my partner, Emily Shifter, will be joining me to co-host the next episodes of Hiring to Firing. Emily works with and counsels clients on a wide variety of employment and human resources matters, including employment discrimination, leave issues, accommodation requests, and wage and hour litigation. With much thanks, we bid Evan farewell and welcome Emily. Now, on to the show. Welcome to Hiring to Firing the Podcast. I'm Tracy Diamond, and I'm here with my partner, Emily Shifter. Together, we tackle all employment issues from hiring to firing. Today, we welcome Trisha Earls of The Hawkins Firm. Trisha focuses on independent internal investigations of employment issues. Before joining The Hawkins Firm, Trisha was Associate Group Counsel and Compliance and Ethics Officer at Equifax, Senior VP and Associate GC for Education Management Corporation, and Chief People, Legal, and Compliance Officer at Tegra, a private equity-owned sports apparel manufacturer. Welcome, Trisha. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your practice? Thank you, Emily. It's great to be here. As you mentioned, yes, I'm in, in private practice now, and primarily my practice is conducting independent investigations for companies. And generally, these investigations are around harassment, discrimination, retaliation type issues. I've had companies also outsource escalated hotline or ethics whistleblower complaints for investigation. And really, I think I accidentally fell into this niche because of having spent so much time in-house, I've spent 15 years of my career in-house and human resources and legal roles and just got good at or have a gift for uh, developing rapport with employees and knowing how corporations work. So it makes it easy to navigate these types of things. So I accidentally ended up in this niche. You definitely have a gift. I know you've helped several of my clients with some tricky investigation issues. So you're in the right niche for sure. Well, thank you. We're thrilled to have you today, Tricia. Thank you for joining us. And today, in light of the upcoming election, we thought it would be a good time for a discussion about managing political discourse in the workplace. As we always do on Hiring to Firing, we're going to kick off our discussion with a TV show. And for today's topic, we chose Mad Men, the drama series starring John Hamm that chronicled the lives of executives of Sterling Advertising Agency on Madison Avenue in the 1960s Manhattan. In this clip, Don and his colleagues watch an ad for Nixon in light of the upcoming 1960 presidential election between Kennedy and Nixon. I would like to talk to you for a moment about dollars and cents, your dollars and cents. Now, my opponents want to increase federal expenditures as much as $18 billion a year. How will they pay for it? There are only two ways. One is to raise your taxes. Turn it off. The other... An ad made by a public relations team. Message received and forgotten. We should give this to Franz for some music. Nixon's campaign song in the key of E. Ethel, go get the ice pick. That Nixon guy is on TV again. Should have never been this close. In today's world, if the polls are any indication, our country remains pretty divided with really strong opinions on both sides of the political spectrum. This means that it's likely that in most workplaces, employees have strong opinions on both sides of all issues and certainly want to talk about them in the workplace. As we get closer and closer to the election, what are some best practices for maintaining a calm, professional workplace? What do you think, Trisha? I would recommend that you start with reminding employees about the policies you do have. Most companies don't have policies that 
uh, ban all political discourse in the workplace. That kind of policy would, frankly, just not be very easy to enforce. And you would run into issues, First Amendment issues for public employers, NLRA issues for, for all employers, but especially unionized employers. And some state have laws around that political speech is protected speech. So I think the most practical way to, to address this is just focus on the policies you do have and remind employees that your no harassment policy or your equal opportunity or no discrimination policy or your retaliation policies are still in effect. So that political discourse turns into arguments about religion, for example, the abortion issue or around immigration which is very hot right now, that it could run afoul of these policies. So the best way to tackle this is just rely on the common sense policies you already have and remind employees about them. Do you think that it would be okay for employers to say to employees, while you're on the clock, we need you to be focusing on the work that's at hand and not talking about anything personal, including your political beliefs? I think Generally, yes, but anything taken too far could start running afoul of some of these issues. So I think generally, it's a great idea to say, hey, we're here to work, redirect them back to the work of the work, as opposed to engaging in personal conversation. And then if it becomes extreme, then you have to consider you know, disciplinary measures. But then you also have to take a fact-specific inquiry, right? What did they say? Is it protected speech under the First Amendment? Is it about the terms and conditions of employment. So it could be covered by the NLRA. Is it other types of political speech, depending on which state you're in? So you, then you have to get a lot more focused on what you do. But generally speaking, yes, I think it's my uh, practice has always been redirect them back to the work of the work. So let's say an employee starts talking about their political beliefs and let's say their political beliefs are on the extreme side of one side or the other and it starts getting other employees upset. Emily and Trisha, you know, what do you think an employer can do at that point to try to calm everybody down? I think Trisha is right that you can start with your existing policies. And, you know, if you've got a standards of conduct or, you know, respect in the workplace type of a policy, that's kind of your first step. I think you're right, Trisha. A lot of my clients don't have specific policies about, you know, political speech specifically or leading up to the election. And I've had some some ask about whether we should or whether we shouldn't. But I think one of the challenges, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that, is how to make sure that you are placing people, so to speak, equally. You know, how do you make sure managers know if, you know, maybe you disagree with the employee's opinion, so you're deciding to, you know, crack down on that, but maybe not someone who you agree with. How, how do you make sure that that is handled equally? Yeah, that's a tricky one because the HR leader or the business leader is not in every conversation. So you don't know. But I think you hit on an important policy that I didn't mention before. And most companies have some version of standards of conduct, i.e. be professional in the workplace, right? So if political discussions, even if they don't touch on religion or immigration or other things that makes them encompassed by the no harassment policy, if they're still engaging in hostile communication or it's devolving into a fight, then you can address it under those policies by stating it's unprofessional to engage, to be uncivil to your colleagues in the workplace. In terms of, of equal enforcement, I mean, I think you just have to go out and, again, being proactive sometimes is helpful here. Remind your managers, these are our policies, and remind them of the um, standards of conduct or the professional, be professional in the workplace policy, whatever your company calls it, and then remind them they have to address things equally. They represent all employees, just like HR does. You have to represent all of your employees and so you have to be neutral and fair, and you can't bring your political opinions into whom you discipline and whom you don't. The HR person should be asking those questions. If it comes to them and it's always one side of the aisle versus the other, then they should be asking those questions before they head down the discipline path. Right. Doing some fact-finding themselves. You mentioned something else, too, about you know concerns about protected speech. And I know sometimes employers, especially who are not unionized, forget a little bit about what the rules are there and you know may even erroneously assume that the National Labor Relations Act doesn't apply to them. What are the important things to be aware of there, especially as we're heading into election season? As a very broad net, right? The National Labor Relations Act protects employees if they are discussing generally, and you guys can certainly correct me and add to this definition, the terms and conditions of employment. So if it's related to the terms and conditions of employment and it's 
concerted, meaning it's more than one person discussing it, then it's protected speech. So employers have to be very careful about cracking down. For example, telling employees they can't share their salaries with each other is would run afoul of that. What about um, employees that come into the office wearing political insignia, a T-shirt, a hat, a pin? Can employers do anything to prohibit that? If not, you know, how do they handle if an employee on the other side of the spectrum, political spectrum, gets upset? Yeah, another landmine, right? <laughs> this is also probably a fact-specific inquiry. I would think I would definitely like you guys to opine as well. But I think it starts with what type of employer are you, right? Are you a public employer? Does the Constitution apply, which has First Amendment protections? And so that might be protected speech. Are you a unionized employer, even though, as we just said, an LRA applies to all employers, but maybe your collective bargaining agreement says something about this if you are a unionized employer? Also, what state are you in? Last time I looked, there are 11 states that have some sort of protection for political activity, and they're all phrased very differently. So what they actually protect is very different. So you have to know what state you're in. And then what are your existing policies? If your existing policies already ban slogans, any type of slogan in the workplace, then maybe you can regulate and say no, no political pins whatsoever or political slogans whatsoever. It's a minefield. I definitely like your thoughts on this. Well, how have you tackled this? Yeah, I would say that if an employer really is concerned about this, that it would be good for them to put out a policy now, assuming they're in a state where they can do so before somebody comes in wearing some kind of political slogan that they're going to have to handle. So this way, the policy is out for everybody to see ahead of time, and it's written in a very neutral way. Emily, what do you think? That's right. I think you have to pretty much ban everything. You know, it's not just political speech, but it might be even things like I'm, you know, wearing a Live Strong bracelet, you know, or, or you know, trying to a breast cancer pink ribbon in October, which might be tough. Culturally, I think employers have to think about that, too. You know, if you're going to do a broad policy like that, are you going to inadvertently take away things that employees are used to? being able to express. And I think it also depends on the type of workplace. Certainly, if you're the type of employer where, you know, employees are wearing uniforms or there might be safety considerations, you know, neutral reasons to limit what people can wear, the types of things that they can bring if they're directly interfacing with customers, that might be a different situation than maybe a white collar workplace uh, where people are in their individual offices and cubicles. So I think it really does take consideration, not just of the law applicable to you, where you operate, but also what your workplace culture is like. Yeah, I think that if you take it to the next level, think about remote workplaces, too. If someone's in their home office and there happens to be some kind of, I don't know, bobblehead, something on their desk that is visible on the camera, can you regulate that when it's actually in their home? It's very interesting. I just wanted to expand on something you just said. The work culture is really important. Your company culture, really, you really have to understand it to know the reaction you're going to get if you implement a new policy, especially right before the election. And one thing I would say is any heavy-handed policy or just broad encompassing policy that you enforce, it can backfire on you. And remember, these are your employees after the election too. And you may have done some harm to morale that is going to take you a while to recover from. Again, being a practitioner, practically speaking, having been in-house, sometimes the best way to, to handle this is just address it if it becomes an escalated situation where you have to step in and take action. But trying to prevent all actions from the beginning sometimes is a fool's errand. Such an important point. Yeah. I'd like to take us to our next clip. In this clip, an applicant who goes by the name Duck discusses or is asked who he's going to vote for in the Kennedy-Nixon election. And he talks about whether he should tell the agency who he's going to vote for. Let's take a listen. Here's a test. Who'd you vote for? If I say Nixon, you'll think I'm buttering you. If I say Kennedy, you'll want to reform me. So, uh... I'll say Nixon. <laughs> That's nice to say. So is it allowed? Is Sterling Agency violating any laws by asking Duck who he's going to vote for? Certainly not today. As we talked about, voting is protected speech and voting is protected political activity. Let's say it that way. So if you're a public employer asking that question is very problematic. And then in many states, as we talked about, could be very problematic because then the assumption will be if the individual doesn't get the job, that it's because of their political views. So you, you basically set yourself up for some potential liability. 
Yeah, I would say it's a bad idea. Even in for private employers that may not have any express prohibitions against asking, don't think it's necessarily a good idea to be asking because if you then take any form of adverse action, it'll be assumed that it was because of the person's political beliefs, which could be problematic. And employees have a long memory. That is true. Even if you do hire them three years from now, that will be remembered. So generally not a wise thing to do. What about customers or clients that bring up political discussions to employees? Is there any concerns there? I think so. I mean, especially if the employee is offended. And I think, again, something you can do practically is to prepare if an employee is customer facing and it is likely that that employee has a sensitivity to certain issues or, you know, your customer base is likely to say something, then you prepare the employee for how to respond. Right. So you give them the script, so to speak. You say, we understand this may happen. If it happens, please report it to us immediately and we will look into it. However, here's something you could say that would not be offensive to the customer and changes the dialogue or changes the narrative or just changes the conversation. Arming employees with how to respond helps prevent that customer situation from devolving into something even worse. Yeah, and what you said, Trisha, reminds me of um, another important point, which is it would be a good idea now, you know, to start talking to your managers and training them on how to handle these situations as they come up, as we get closer and closer and closer to the election, rather than just sort of avoiding the issue and hoping it doesn't make its way into your workplace. Be prepared so you know how, and your ma- and your managers and supervisors know how to respond if any of this heats up. Great idea. Very good to be proactive in training your managers. And it's a good time to remind them, I think, kind of to your point earlier, Joshua, about all your existing policies. I think whether it's a coworker, whether it's a customer, you know, reminding them that hostile work environment claims, harassment, discrimination, all of those things are things they need to be aware of, especially as managers in particular. And to the extent that any election-related discourse devolves into a situation that might raise one of those issues, I think it's absolutely a good idea to be putting that on managers' radar. I agree. Clearly, there were strong opinions about the 1960 election, and they were very pro-Nixon. I would imagine we have employers who also have strong opinions about the election results. Talking about the private workplace now, you know, can an employer encourage employees to vote a certain way? Can they mandate that their employees vote a certain way? donate to political causes, attend a political rally, but where are the limits to what an employer who wants the election to go a certain way, what they can do in terms of their workplace? Well, lots of questions in there. <laughs> Let's start. Can they ask employees to vote a certain way? Not generally, even in the private workplace. As we talked about, there are lots of states that have laws around this. It's just an unwise thing to do, setting yourself up for some type of claim that any subsequent adverse action was because of their political views. And more importantly, we have a private ballot, right? You're not going to know how your employees vote anyway. So it it also seems like a pretty impractical thing to do. Impossible to enforce, right? Exactly. So part B of that was donate. Donating to a political cause or attending a political rally. Can employers require employees to do so? Yeah, I think generally the answer is the same. It's not really you know, even for private employers, I do know there is an exception under the Federal Election Commission rule for senior executives. Companies can ask them to support political action committees, and, and I've had clients do that. In that context, it's generally because there was some legislation pending against that particular employer that they were asking for such support. It's, I haven't seen employers do it in just a general presidential election. I have seen employers who are politically connected or politically minded inviting candidates to their offices and inviting employees to come listen to them talk. That seems to be okay as long as it's voluntary and not something that's mandated. Right, because there's one state that says you can't hold mandatory meetings on political issues. Mm -hmm. Right, and there's captive audience laws in certain states that say you can't force employees to to sit and listen to you, which I think more commonly comes up when you're, you know, an employer who's trying to maybe discourage employees from voting, you know, to join the union, but definitely would apply in this situation too. But again, and I agree with you, Tracy, that employers do invite political candidates, but then you run the morale risk because as you know, the polls show, we're pretty evenly divided as a country. So you have the morale risk that employees think that is a heavy handed thing to do, or they feel like if they don't go, they feel ostracized. They will perceive that potentially, this is all potential, but they'll potentially perceive any negative action subsequent that it's because you didn't attend the speech of their favorite candidate. 
So a better practice that I've seen, and usually employees generally tend to appreciate it, is to just encourage voting. And even on the company internet, have a link to all of the candidates' websites with a message about go educate yourself. This is our privilege as a, an American society. We encourage you to vote. We encourage you to educate yourself and make the decision that's best for you. And messages like that resonate with employees as opposed to we subtly trying to persuade them to vote a particular way. Yeah, I, th- I love that. I think that's a great message that's not controversial, which is go out there and vote. And whatever be- side of the, the political spectrum you're on, we're encouraging you to go exercise your civic duty. On that note, are there any laws around time off for voting or working as a poll worker or an election official? Tons of them. (laughs) There's something about time off. It varies widely by state. Some states where you expect that it be paid time, it's not. Very generally speaking, the law is generally that you have to give some amount of unpaid time in most states to allow employees to vote if they can't get to the poll during normal work hours or outside of normal work hours, let me say it that way. But not all states. Some states don't have any laws on it whatsoever. So then turning to what is a best practice as opposed to what's legally required, generally employers will, again, do some education ahead of time and give certain time off, unpaid or paid, depending on the state or depending on their policy, to allow employees to have plenty of time to go vote. Yeah, I think this is an area where multi-state employers can sometimes have just a morass of different laws and requirements. You know, do you have to let them go vote if there's three hours before their shift or two? And you're right, some states, they don't require leave, but they just say no one can be terminated or disciplined for going to vote. There are states where you have to give a particular notice of what the voting rules are in that state to employees. So it's definitely something, this is a perfect time for employers to be brushing off those laws and making sure that they're aware of what exactly it is that they need to offer to employees. Or just being generous and letting employees go exercise their civic duty and vote. Yeah, for sure. Part of a morale, HR morale's perspective, a best practice is get on top of this now and come up with your policy and go educate your managers. This is our policy. Usually it's going to be more generous than the law and allowing, you know, two hours paid time off at the end of election day to go vote is widely appreciated by the employees. And yes, some employees will abuse it and not go vote, but that's okay. You gain more in terms of the morale, improving morale and trust. And it's not very long and it's only once a year. Yeah. We've talked a lot about, you know, limiting speech in the workplace and arming managers with the tools that they need to kind of quiet things down, calm things down. But speaking of morale, I'm kind of curious, both of your thoughts, is there a place where we might encourage political speech in the workplace or is there room for healthy, productive dialogue in the workplace and kind of what guardrails could employers who don't want to just say absolutely not, let's limit it as much as possible could put into place to make sure it stays productive? Well, if you'd asked me this 20 years ago or 10 years ago, I would have given you a very different answer. I will share one story. Uh, During the pandemic and when the George Floyd murder happened, I was in-house. I was head of HR for a manufacturing company at that time. And we found that there was a lot of workplace conflict and there was a lot of just, just disrupted behavior and there's a lot of lack of productivity. And I understand this is not purely a political issue, but it is. It does veer into politics, but it was a very emotional issue for our employees. And so one thing we did, it was hold listening sessions. So what the CEO and I flew to every location in the United States and had open employee meetings and invited anybody that wanted to come. And we just opened the meeting with, we understand this is what transpired was very upsetting to many of our employees, and we're just here to listen. And the only question we asked was, how do you want your company to support you during this time? And what surprised me, they didn't ask us to do anything. They just wanted to be heard. And there was an incredible amount of respect given to the employees who wanted to be heard. I was very pleased. And they were very pleased that the CEO took time out of his schedule to come listen. And the amount of goodwill we gained from that and trust it was imaginable. So that's an example. I don't know if that completely applies in the flip, purely political context, but if there's something that is so hurtful that is disrupting your organization, you could try some version of that. Well, before you get to your next story, though, Trisha, I just want to you know point out at the end of this election, this election will come and it will go and somebody is going to win and somebody is going to lose. 
And to your point earlier about how the country is evenly split, it means that you may very well have employees that are very happy in your workplace at the same time as having employees that are very upset. Right. And so thinking through those post-election conversations with employees to make sure the employees that are upset are okay and getting everybody back to work, I think are very it's a very important thought process as well, that it doesn't just end on election day, that there needs to be some thought put into the post-election scenario as well. Yep. Yeah, how you manage through a crisis is very telling of whether you either gain credibility or lose it. And so and it'll be a crisis to some, but not to all. And that's what makes this so interesting, right? Because some people will be celebrating and at the same time, there'll be employees that'll be upset. Yeah. It's always the challenge of employment law, right? Is people bring, they can't help but bring what's going on outside the world to the workplace. And I think being aware of that and, and supporting employees, no matter where they fall on the happy or sad side of things is important. Yeah. Yeah. So, Chisha, you had one other example that you wanted to share as well. Well, and this is a strategy that may work for after the election. So it flows nicely from what you just said. So also during the pandemic, we had employees who were very energized, motivated, passionate about certain political causes that they wanted to champion. And, and so rather than turn the workplace into a place to debate these things, we formed a committee and said, OK, it was basically the civic or charitable employee committee and ask them to go out and research various different charitable causes that they would like the company to get involved in and come back with uh, suggestions. But we put some conditions on it. It's not just where you want the company to donate money, where there are opportunities for employees to get involved in donating time. And we will give employees paid time off to do it. If they felt passionate about it, then they should want to donate their time to it as well. They came back with some great ideas that really cross the political aisle as well, where everyone, and we found some charities that really w appealed to the vast majority of our organization, and we adopted those. And so we turned into what started out as divisive and brought people together. It's a great way to, to be forward thinking and try to bring everybody back together again after November comes and goes. So well, look, this has been a really timely discussion, and we very much appreciate you taking the time to talk with us today, Tricia. And thank you to our listeners for listening in. Please don't forget to check out our blog, hiringtofiring.law. Listen to our other podcast episodes, Hiring to Firing, where you can find them on all of the major podcast platforms. And shoot us an email. Let us know what you think and give us some suggestions for future TV shows and episodes. Thanks for listening. Copyright Troutman Pepper Hamilton Sanders, LLP. These recorded materials are designed for educational purposes only. This podcast is not legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of the individual participants. Troutman Pepper does not make any representations or warranties, express or implied, regarding the contents of this podcast. Information on previous case results does not guarantee a similar future result. Users of this podcast may save and use the podcast only for personal or other non-commercial educational purposes. No other use, including, without limitation, reproduction, retransmission or editing of this podcast may be made without the prior written permission of Troutman Pepper. If you have any questions, please contact us at Troutman.com.